welcome back. Um, we're, today we're going to be talking about orbits and gravity. Now, hopefully you've had a chance then to go ahead and look at the constellations. And remember too that I want you to be checking Blackboard because there will be some things that I want you to do relative to the constellations now as well as looking at some online simulations of what we're going to be talking about today. So make sure you check Blackboard. So like I said, today we're going to be talking about orbits and gravity. And you can see there is your, of course, let's go to the Picture of the Day website for uh, NASA. So please make sure you're also continuing to do that. So we're going to start talking about planetary motion today. Now we go back and we think about Tycho Brahe, about 1570, so a little bit before uh, Galileo. Galileo was the 1600s right around the same time that you were having Copernicus coming along. And remember we were talking about how Copernicus said, well, no, really, the Earth was not at the center of our solar system. The Sun was. Well, we need to look at what's going on there to try and come up with some evidence to support that, as well as to see what's going on in terms of the motion of the planets within the sky. And so one of the things that Tycho did was observe very, very well. And first thing he observed was a new star, and we're going to come back to that new star when we start talking about the evolution of stars in our third unit, because what Tycho was able to observe was a star that had basically blown itself apart. But more importantly, what Tycho did was he established an observatory, in which case he was able to very accurately determine the position of the sun, the moon, and the planets. Now remember Hipparchus. Remember when we talked about him? Did somewhat the same thing, only he did it for stars. Well, what Tycho did is he did, that, he did that same very precise measurements for what were going on with the planets, as well as the moon and the sun. And this is a picture of Tycho. And if you look really close, guys, you're going to see that he has kind of a funny looking nose. And that's because that's a metal nose, um, probably made out of silver. And he kind of had it whacked off when he was a young man. Now, he was at a party, all these scientists go to these really wild parties, and he got into a fight, not over a girl, he got into a fight over a scientific principle. And so the way they settled that fight was they drew swords, and unfortunately Tycho lost. He got his nose whacked off. And so from a very young age, he did indeed have that silver nose. And we think it might have caused uh, a little bit more of a premature death, and we'll talk about his death a little bit later on, simply because of the fact that you had then a metallic um, that stayed on his face so much and, and basically had problems in with that the latter part of his life. So Tycho was rather famous for his temper and for the arguments he would get into. Now, he did go ahead and establish an observatory, and it was for the King of Denmark. And this was basically an island that we set up this as an observatory. But now remember, guys, we don't have telescopes yet. He's a little bit before Galileo, so telescopes don't exist. But they were observational instruments that measured positions very accurately. And so they were those kinds of observations, not observations made with an astronomical telescope. And you can kind of see here looking at a sextant, being able to measure very accurate positions because of the size of the instrument that you were using. So it kind of gave you a feel for what that looked like, what that observatory was like. And if you just kind of look down, you can see on this picture that you have the main part of the observatory there in the center, and then on the four ends or four um, edges there, you've got more astronomical instruments as well as the instrumentation at the end of the sidewalks. And this is just another section of what it looked like. Again, these are our disconceptions, but they are mimicked after the real uh, island. And this is where Tycho was buried. And it is said in one of the great, probably, uh, Times of the not sure that it's really true, but supposedly when Tycho died, what happened was he was at a party, and during that time it was not polite to get up and go to the bathroom before your monarchy did, before the king got up, and so Tycho, having had a huge amount of wine and beer, things like that to drink, had the urge to go to the bathroom. And of course, you couldn't do that, like I said, before your king got up or gave you leave. And so um, said that his bladder went ahead and finally burst. And so it took him 
oh, several weeks to go ahead and die, and they think that he probably died because he also believed in making his own medicine, and so there might have been some problems with the medicine that he gave himself, the fact that he did have a bursted bladder, all kinds of, you know, kind of rules that have grown up because of or how Tycho might have died. Not exactly sure, but they think it's probably a combination of looking at some of the medicine that he took because of then the stomach problems that he had due to the fact that you did have some internal problems when that bladder burst. So very interesting guy, but we remember him not for the way he died or the way he lived, but for the observations that he made, which were extremely important then to go ahead and look at planetary motion. Now, right before Tycho went ahead and retired or died, he had a man by the name of Kepler, Johannes Kepler, that came in and started working for him. And so he was almost like a research assistant or an observational assistant. And so when Tycho died, he let Kepler have all those observations. And so from those observations, remember more than 20 years of observations, we were able to then to go ahead and determine what the laws of planetary motion were. And so Kepler came along and took that and was able to determine what we now call our Kepler's three laws that really describe planetary motion. Now remember before Kepler came along, all of those orbits from the planets were assumed to be circles. Remember when we talked about uh, Ptolemy and, and all the epicycles that he put together to be able to explain what was going on with the planetary motion? Well, all those things were in the form of circles because a circle was a nice, perfect geometric object. However, Kepler didn't quite come up with that. Uh, so Kepler went ahead and described planetary motion based on those observations. And so we have what are called Kepler's three laws, and, and this is Kepler himself. Very distinguished looking and kept that beard throughout all of his life. You see the descriptions and drawings of him when he's older, and it is still very there, very prominent. So let's look at Kepler's first law. And it says planetary orbits are ellipses with the sun at one foci. So now what's an ellipse? Well, first of all, it's not a circle. Okay, I want you to think of a circle and to kind of flatten it, and that's what an ellipse is. And the way that I go ahead and produce an ellipse is by placing two pins in some kind of board and taking a string and pulling it around that, and I'll show you here what I mean in just a minute. But if we think about where an ellipse comes from, it's nothing more than a conic section. Now, if I have a nice cone there, I want you to think of taking a slice through that cone at the, you know, somewhere at the very top, but doing it at a nice parallel slice with the ground. Okay? And when you do that nice parallel slice with the ground, you end up with a nice perfect circle. Now, if you take that slice and instead making it perfectly parallel with the ground, you now make it come at some angle, and what you can see right here is they're making it an angle, you are indeed going to get an ellipse. Like I said, it's basically at an angle relative to a circle being at a nice parallel. And so the way that you make that ellipse is you go ahead and put two pins in some kind of board. You put a string, whatever length that you want around it, and then stretch that string out with a pencil and just move that pencil all the way around. And you do indeed, indeed get an ellipse formed. And you can see that's what's going on right here with this drawing. They're forming an ellipse. Well, let's talk about some terms in that ellipse, and now I want to go back then and show you exactly what those terms mean. First term for an ellipse is a major axis. A major axis is the greatest distance across, and will divide the orbit exactly in half. So that's your major axis, and then we have a semi-major axis, which is basically half of your major axis. Then the foci are the two points within the ellipse that define what that ellipse looks like. And for Kepler, Kepler said, well, one of those was the sun. The other is just basically a point in space. And then we have the minor axis, which divides the major axis in half, and is also perpendicular to the major axis. And then we have an eccentricity, which tells us how flattened the ellipse is. Okay, so if you want to take a circle and kind of flatten it, you're going to get your ellipse. So this is an ellipse. I've got two of my circles right there, which are the foci. And you can see my major axis, which is that line running across that divides the orbit in half. And then you have your semi-major axis, 
And that's where you're going to, within your semi-major axis, you're always going to have one of your foci there. And then your minor axis, notice, is perpendicular to your major axis. Okay, so those are the important points that you have on your ellipse. Now, the eccentricity, like I said, defines how squashed your orbit is. And your eccentricity is basically the distance between your two foci divided by the major axis. And we're going to come back to that, not in this section, but in the next section when I have you guys do... Uh, Kepler's three laws on an online simulation. So that's one of the things that you're going to want to check Blackboard for. And there will be a sheet of paper on there that kind of goes through this again and gives you instructions on what I want you to do with that lab so that you can indeed look at uh, Kepler's laws for yourself. Now remember, guys, this is a circle. This is an ellipse. If I think about that circle, remember that we have a diameter, which we call that major axis. In this case, the diameter is the same all the way around. Now, the reason that I showed you the circle, though, is because if we go back and we look at this ellipse, the orbits of those planets we know are ellipses, but they're probably not nearly as flattened as what this one is. Most of our orbits that are ellipses for the planets tend to be not flattened very much. Okay, and so we're going to look at the eccentricities of the planet's orbits and we're going to compare them on one of the, this activity that I'm going to have you do on Kepler's three laws and look at how each one of those planets compare. And probably if we look at the outer planets looking at Neptune, then we're looking, looking at very, very elliptical orbits compared then to the inner. If we look at Mercury, like it's got an eccentricity of 0.21. You know, the Earth's orbit is a little bit more of a circle. So it's like, you know, 0.01. So they do change, but they're mostly very, very slightly flattened ellipses. So we've got a couple of other terms we need to talk about, and those are perihelium and aphelium. And perihelium is the closest approach to the sun, and aphelium is the furthest out from the sun. We will come back to aphelium and perihelium when we talk about seasons and why we have seasons. But just to kind of go sh and show you where these two are relative to an ellipse, perihelium is the closest approach to the sun, aphelium is the furthest point, and they are again going to occur on the major axis. So you can see that I have there on the left labeled as perihelium because that is indeed the sun, and then aphelium is the furthest distance which is going to be all the way toward the end. That also has an implication relative to how fast the planet is moving at that point. Perihelium, your planet is closest to the sun, it's closer to a greater gravitational mass, and it's going to be moving faster. And aphelium is further away from the sun, therefore it's further away from that really massive gravitational mass, and it's going to be moving slower. And so that will have some implications then in how far our planet is moving along its orbit. So what Kepler's second law says is that the motion of the planets sweep out an equal area at an equal time. And so therefore, at times, the planet is closer to the sun and moves faster because of that increased gravitational attraction. Well, guys, that's what I was just talking about here. At perihelium, the planet, whichever planet we're talking about, still is going to be moving faster because it's closer to the sun as opposed to aphelium, in which case it's moving slower. Now, this is a schematic showing kind of what's going on there. You see the sun, and you see during the time that is at perihelium, the sun is going to move, excuse me, the planet is going to move quite a distance along that orbit. And the distance that that arc represents is one month. Then if I look at what's going on in position three and four, well, there we're looking more at aphelium but notice that the planet is moving slower. So the same distance time-wise from 3 to 4 is also a month. From 1 to 2 is a month same way, only the triangle that gets divided out from 1 and 2 is kind of a short, fat triangle, where from 3 and 4, it's a long, thin triangle. However, if I look at the area of those two triangles, then remember, according to Kepler's second law, is those are equal areas. So the motion of the planet sweeps out an equal area in an equal time. 
So if I look at those two triangles, that light blue part would be exactly the same. And if I took a piece of graph paper and I put it over that, then I could count the number of squares to give me the number of square units. Then I would find that the number of square units is the same for both of those plant or both of those triangles. So that's Newton or Kepler's second law. Now remember, all this was based on very accurate data that Tycho had taken over 20 years. Kepler had not had that data to be able to look at. There's no way he would have been able to come up with these laws. So even though they're called Kepler's laws, remember they are based on what Tycho did in terms of all of his observations. And then Kepler's third law looks at the average distance versus the average period of the planet. So it says the square of the period of the revolution, how long it takes to go around the sun, is directly proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis when the distance is in astronomical units and the period is in years. So what does that really mean? Well, if I look at the average distance that the planet is from the sun, which because of the fact that it's going to change, you know, part of the time it's a perihelion, part of the time it's aphelion, then it's moving in between those, we're just going to take an average distance. And if I take that distance and I cube it, then it's equal to the period squared, the average distance that it takes for the planet to go around the sun. Now, we want to have consistent units. And so you put the period in terms of years, and you put the distance in terms of astronomical units. Now, an astronomical unit is nothing more than the average distance that the Earth is from the sun, which is about 93 million miles. And so when you do that, you're looking at that ratio of distance cubed for period squared for every one of the planets. And one of the things that I've got posted in Blackboard is for you to look at that ratio for every one of the planets, for Mercury all the way through Neptune. And so you can actually calculate that and see that, yes, does it come out to be the same as what it does for the Earth? Now, if I think about the Earth, okay, what, how long does it take for us to go around the sun? Well, it takes one year, essentially. And if the average distance is one astronomical unit, then one cubed should be equal to one squared. Well, you know it is. One cubed is one. One squared is one. So yes, that ratio does come out to be one. And so I'm going to have you look at that and actually calculate it for the other planets to see that it does indeed come out the same. And then from that, I'm going to have you then go look at Newton's, or Kepler's first law and second law in terms of an onion line simulation to look at then how those things are compared and how those things are done. Now, we're taking a leap here going from Kepler's laws of planetary motion to Newton's laws of motion. Now, Newton's laws of motion work just in general. Okay? Everything that you see out there follows Newton's laws of motion whether we're talking about gravity, whether we're talking about just moving, whether we're talking about the planets moving around an object, whether we're talking about you ice skating across a frozen lake. You know, those things are following Newton's laws, okay? And so basically Newton's laws help lay the foundation for a lot of what we do in the physical science, along with the optics, put the mathematics together with it. So it basically lays what's going on with physics and chemistry and biology and earth science and all those things that deal with motion. So this is Newton. You're probably more familiar with Newton thinking about Newton and the apple. You know, Newton was the one that was out there in the field during the summer and he was sitting under the apple tree and an apple fell on his head and from that he realized gravity is what keeps everything in orbit around everything and everything is attracted to everything else. It might have been a tad bit of a stretch, but it sounds like a really good story. For those of you that have taken calculus, also you have Newton to thank because Newton helped invent calculus. So let's talk about Newton's first law. Newton's first law is sometimes called the law of inertia. And Newton's first law says that a body will continue in state of motion unless compelled to change. Okay, so a body will continue in its state of motion unless compelled to change. You know, you're sitting there really relaxed in a nice chair. It's going to take something to get you out of that chair because you're not really compelled to get up. Okay, 
And so Newton's first law, like I said, is sometimes called the law of inertia. It's simply that property of a body that's going to resist a change in direction, okay? Or a change in motion. So that motion can change due to changing its speed or it can do to a change in its direction. Now, one of the things that comes out of Newton's first law is that rest is equivalent to constant motion. So a body will stay at rest unless acted upon by an outside force, or a body will stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. So rest is definitely equivalent to motion. And one of the things that a lot of people tend to get real confused about is they think that if you're in space, that to stay in motion in space, you've got to have some kind of rocket that keeps giving you that little push. Well, that's not true, guys. Once you get that initial push, that body is going to stay in motion unless something compels it to go ahead and change. Either it gets too close to another large body and you have a gravitational attraction, something runs into it, whatever. But once you get started, it does not take any additional force and that's what we're going to talk about with Newton's laws or force, to go ahead and keep it in motion. It's going to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. A lot of times people don't understand that friction is an outside force. And one time friction was thought to be something that was contained within a body. So I have a certain amount of friction because I have a certain amount of mass or a certain amount of force. Well, that friction really is not contained in a body. That Friction is produced because of interactions between a body and the surface that it's acting on. Okay, so law of inertia, body will continue in its state of motion unless acted upon or compelled to change. So rest is a state of motion, which no forces are acting on it, or the net forces that are acting on it are equal to zero. Same way with constant motion. Okay. Constant motion is either no forces acting on it or the sum of my forces that are acting on it are equal to zero. Now, what Newton's first law is talks about what happens if a force acts on an object and the fact that that force will cause an object to change its state of motion. What Newton's second law does is really defines what indeed is a force. And so Newton's second law says your force is equal to mass times your acceleration. So a force is made up of a mass times an acceleration. So that means, guys, that force is composed of two things. It's composed of a mass. It's composed of an acceleration. I can have a really small mass and a really large acceleration, or I can have a really small acceleration and a really large mass. And those two can still be equivalent because the fact mass and acceleration are inversely proportional to each other. They're indirectly proportional to each other. One increases, the other one decreases for a given force. Okay. So F is equal to force, M is equal to mass, and A is equal to acceleration. Now you guys are probably more familiar in thinking about your force is equal to mass times acceleration in terms of your rate, excuse me, in terms of your weight. Your weight that you have here on the Earth is dependent upon your mass and the acceleration due to gravity on the Earth. Okay, the acceleration due to gravity on the Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared. If I look at it in the English system, it's 32 feet per second squared. Okay. Most people are probably more familiar with the units of force in the English system, which we call pounds, as opposed to the unit of force in the metric system. Now, if I think about your mass in the metric system, your mass in the metric system is measured either in kilograms or grams. And my guess is most of you don't have a clue what your mass is measured in in terms of the English system. Well, if I think about what your mass is measured in, I want you to think about when you were a youngster and you went outside and you saw these things that were kind of slimy and moving along on the ground. Well, those are slugs. And that's what your mass is measured in the English system. Now, most of you have heard about kilograms or grams. Most of you have heard about pounds. Very few of you have heard about slugs and newtons. Well, that's because the general public incorrectly, guys, and I say incorrectly again, compares forces in pounds or forces in ounces, something like that, to mass in grams or kilograms. 
Those two are not measuring the same things. They are really measuring two different things. Your force is measuring how that mass is affected by the acceleration, in this case, acceleration due to gravity. Your mass really is the amount of stuff that you have, the amount of stuff that's contained in your body. Now, I want you to think about what it's like if I had you here on the Earth and if I had you on the moon. Okay, are you going to feel differently if you're on the moon? Well, yeah, definitely you are. But are you going to be different if you're on the moon relative to you, the amount of mass it took? No, your mass is not going to change. Okay, your mass does not depend upon your position. Your mass is how much stuff you have. What does change is the force based on where you are. Okay, you know that you can jump six times higher, you know, those kinds of things. You're going to feel lighter. You're going to weigh six times less. Well, that's because the moon is smaller than what the Earth is, and so its acceleration due to gravity is one-sixth what it is here on the Earth. We're about 9.8 meters per second squared. It's about 1.6 meters per second squared. But you didn't physically change. It's just how the moon is acting on you. Okay? Now, Newton's second law works for any mass, any acceleration, and any force. It just gives us a feel for what a force is made up of. But then that special case of force is equal to weight, and so weight is equal to mass times acceleration. Now, if I think about a weight of about 2.2 pounds, think about what 2.2 pounds is like, that's equal to about 9.8 newtons. So if you want to figure out your weight in the metric system, okay, I want you to take your weight, multiply by 5, and that's your weight in the newtons, in the metric system. Then I want you to think about that number on your driver's license. And tell me, you think the United States is ever going to go to the metric system? Okay. So on the average, take your weight times 5, and that will give you your weight in newtons. Okay. So that's Newton's second law. It just gives us a feel for what that force is made up of. And then Newton's third law says for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. It means you can't touch without something really touching you. Now, a lot of people are, kind of have a problem with that. If I think about the fact that a Cadillac runs into a Volkswagen, okay, Cadillac runs into a Volkswagen, you're going to probably tend to tell me that one of those forces that got exerted on the Volkswagen is probably greater than the force that got exerted by the Volkswagen on the Cadillac. Seems to make sense, right? Well, guys, that's not true. Remember Newton's third law says for every action there's an opposite and equal reaction. The force that the little Volkswagen exerted on the Cadillac is exactly the same as a Cadillac exerted on the Volkswagen. Newton's third law. For every action there's an opposite and equal reaction. You can't touch without being touched back. Now what did change is that acceleration. You know, when that little Volkswagen ran into that Cadillac, probably the Volkswagen moved a lot more than what the Cadillac did. It had a greater acceleration because it has a smaller mass. Whereas the Cadillac had a much greater mass, so therefore it had a much smaller acceleration. And so a lot of times people get confused and they think that acceleration is the same thing as a force. But remember guys, according to Newton's second law, force is mass times acceleration. You have to think about both of them. Okay? So, for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. The Volkswagen moved a lot more because it had a smaller mass. Well, now let's go back and think about that looking at your weight. Okay, so if I go back and I look at Newton's second law, you're exerting a force on the Earth just like the Earth is exerting a force on you. We call it your weight. The Earth is pulling on you with, let's say, a weight of 150 pounds. But you are also pulling on the Earth with a weight of 150 pounds. Okay, now I want you to think about standing on that earth. Here's my earth. And I want you to jump up off the earth. First of all, we've got to stop the earth from moving. Okay, so you're going to jump up off the earth. Now, what are you going to do? Okay, you're going to come right back down. Well, and that when you come back down, you're moving at an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. You have a certain mass, you have a certain acceleration. But yet, when you jumped up, the recoil of the Earth went down. Just like when you come down, the Earth really is rushing up to meet you. Now, how big is the Earth compared to you? Well, it's a lot bigger. So therefore, it has a much smaller acceleration. 
but yet when I put that acceleration together with its mass, I'm going to come up with your weight of 150 pounds. Okay? And so don't forget that those two forces are equal because it's very common to just kind of forget it and say, okay, no, the Earth is attracting me with a lot more force than I'm attracting it. But that's not true. They are equal and opposite. And that's true for everything that we're looking at. For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. And that means that that force is acting on this object. There is an opposing force that is acting back on that object. And so Newton's third law, those forces have to act on different objects. I'm exerting, or I'm exerting a force on the Earth as much as the Earth is exerting a force on me. For action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. So those are Newton's three laws that deal with forces. Now we also need to think about something called angular momentum. And what I'm trying to do, guys, is just give you some of the physics background of what we're going to need to go ahead and talk about looking at the planets and looking at the stars and looking at then the universe as a whole. And so that's why we're going from Newton's laws right here then to something called angular momentum as well as its law of universal gravity. Now, law of universal gravity is another law from Newton. It was not considered part of his three laws because they weren't really looking at forces in general there. What Newton was looking at here with the law of universal gravity dealed with masses attracting masses. We think about a mass, the amount of stuff that you have. Remember, mass is measured in grams or kilograms in the metric system or in slugs in terms of the English system. It says every piece of mass attracts every other piece of matter. So no matter where, you know, you're sitting there watching this on your computer. You're attracting your computer with as much force as your computer is attracting you. Okay, the magnitude of that attraction is certainly going to depend upon the individual masses as well as the distance between their centers squared. Okay, so this is one of the four known forces in nature. It's a force of gravity, and it's an attraction between different masses. Okay, and if I then look at this equation here, it says F is equal to G M1 M2 over R squared. Well, that F is simply that force of attraction between the two masses. It's dependent upon a gravitational constant times the two masses divided by the distance between their masses squared. So that means if I go ahead and I take those two masses and I move you twice as far, you know, so I moved you twice as far back off of your computer, then I've cut down that force four times. If I move you three times further back, I've cut down on that force then nine times. If I go ahead and set you back where you were, and now I move you twice as close to your computer, now I've increased that force of attraction by two squared or four times. If I move you three times closer, I've increased it by nine times. So you're always changing it by a ratio of the distance between your centers squared. And so if we talk about that force, it's still measured in newtons. If we're talking about the metric system, it's measured in pounds. If we're talking about the English system. And so we talk about then the law of universal gravity as the gravity is what holds the moon in orbit around the earth. And so really the earth is not, or the moon is not going around the earth. The earth and the moon are going around their common center of masses. Same way if I look at the planets within the solar system, okay, we've got the sun going around the common center of mass of both the sun and all the planets. The only difference is that common center of mass actually is in within the sun itself, which is why it always looks like we're going around the sun. We're going to use that when we start looking at finding exoplanets. You know, we're going to look at that star's wobble. Well, that wobble is what we see when that star is going around its common center of mass. It's just that we can't go ahead and see the planets because they're too faint for us to see. So we will come back to that law of universal gravity in terms of trying to find out where all those exoplanets are without, you know, someplace out there and in, in within our galaxy. Now the other thing I want to point out, we talk about the law of universal gravity. Every piece of mass attracts every other piece of matter. We're going to come back to this when we talk about something called dark energy and dark matter. It's not something that is causing the law of universal gravity to be incorrect, but it's some kind of matter out there that we don't really understand that maybe does indeed have some kind of a repulsion effect within pieces of matter. 
Okay, because right now we have never seen anyone, uh, the law of universal gravity, having an anti-force. Everything seems to always be attractive. Where if we look at the other three forces in nature, they do tend to be both attractive and repulsive. So we will come back to this when we start talking about galaxies and what's going on out there to see what really dark matter and dark energy is. So that's his law of universal gravity. F is equal to G M1 M2 over R squared. And of the four forces in nature, the strong and the weak, the electromagnetic and gravity, gravity is by far the weakest one. It just happens to be really strong to us because that's what we interact with more. Now we talked about matter. And so we need to talk about something called density because that does indeed become very important. Now we've talked about mass and the amount of stuff there is in that body and your mass doesn't change as I take you from here to the moon. Okay? Okay, that mass is what you have in you. The volume, however, is the amount of space that that body takes up. Well, when I look at the ratio of mass and volume, then I talk about the density. Okay? So the ratio of mass per unit volume. When we talk about density, it's going to be a gram per centimeter cubed, or it could be a kilogram per meter cubed, you know, those kinds of things out there. And when we look at the densities, of especially the planets, and we compare those densities, we find out that the terrestrial planets, looking at Venus and Earth and Mercury and Mars, are much heavier, have a much higher density than what the gas giants do. Hence the word terrestrial, rocky, solid, compared to the gas giants. Their densities are much less than what uh, the terrestrial planets are. And in fact, as I said the other day when I was showing you Saturn, we had an ocean large enough, Saturn has a density less than that of water, in which case it would go ahead and float. So that's true of those planets, the gas planets. They're definitely um, much, much larger, have a lot more mass, but the volume they take up is known as great, and so therefore they have a density less than that of about two, where we're looking at the terrestrial planets and their density is greater than about three. Okay. Now, the other thing that I alluded to a little bit earlier that we need to make sure we're talking about then is this idea of angular momentum. Now, angular momentum can be thought of as mass in motion. And angular momentum, just like linear momentum, is going to be conserved. We're going to come back and talk about angular momentum a lot when we start talking about how the solar system was formed. And then we'll come back to it when we talk about how those stars are formed. And when those stars are forming and we have planets that are forming when those stars are formed, how do they do that? Well, we're going to come back to angular momentum and think about that mass in motion and how that is conserved. But I want you to think about an ice skater. Okay, so think about someone going along and they're skating and they start going ahead and they start pulling their body in and they put their arms over their head and they're going to start rotating a lot faster. Well, that's a con basically a conservation of angular momentum. So they are changing the distance that that mass is from their center and as that distance gets smaller, their speed goes up. And so angular momentum, you are talking about the spinning or revolving of an object, and that is also conserved as well. And it depends upon the mass, depends upon the velocity, and the distance that mass is from that axis of rotation. So you think about these skaters, and they bring their arms in, because they generally start out with their arms real wide out. They bring those arms in, and a lot of times then they'll put them over their head, and will start spinning very, very fast. Well, that's because of that conservation. Greater distance, they were spinning slower. Smaller distance, I increased that, then therefore my speed had to go up or my velocity had to go up. And so that just kind of gives us then that idea of angular momentum as we start looking at the motion of planets and stars and star clusters and galaxies and all those kinds of things that will become important when we talk about how those things are formed and then how they maintain their motion. If I look at our solar system, most of the planets, not most of them, they all lie basically in the same plane that our sun does and the same plane of rotation. Well, it goes back to looking at that conservation of angular momentum. So it does become very important at looking at the position and the placement and the motion of those celestial objects. Okay, guys, so that kind of finishes what I want to do relative to Kepler's laws, relative to Newton's laws looking at density and looking at angular momentum.
Remember what I want you to do is go check Blackboard because I will have an assignment on Blackboard that I want you to do that deals with Kepler's laws and then looks at a simulation online for Kepler's laws. If you have problems with your computer running that simulation, you may need to go ahead and download some free software. And if you download that and you still have problems, make sure you give me a call, uh, either through the cell number or through Blackboard or whatever email to let me know so we can figure out what's going on and why these simulations are not working. Also remember I want you to be downloading the sky maps and to go outside and look up. Make sure again you take someone that you know, love, and trust as you're not that are out there by yourself. If we're talking about the fall or the early spring, dress warm and wear lots of socks because trust me, if you're standing out there, your toes are going to get really cold. So guys, I will see you next time. Have a great day and I'll talk to you then.